Welcome in to the Husker 24-7 podcast. I'm Mike Schaefer, joined by Michael Brunts here for the bye week. Brian Christopherson is more than likely on his way up to Minnesota, where he will watch his beloved twins play in game four against the Houston Trastros. Brunts, how do you how do you feel like that's gonna go for him? I know that's that's a little dangerous having yeah. a watching a team clinch on your own field. That's not yeah. good. I uh I don't know. I it just it feels like we're getting the Nolan Ryan series of Houston versus Texas. None of that is compelling to me whatsoever. Uh, I'm putting all of my faith in the Arizona Diamondbacks to take out the Dodgers, so I don't have to watch the Dodgers in uh, in the postseason anymore. Um, otherwise, like a you know, I notice you're not sporting your Spiffy Orioles hat. Did that you know? Uh, are you done with that after a postseason appearance that featured no wins? If you want, if you want a team to just go in the absolute trash, um, buy me their hat. That, that's what I've learned. If you want the Dodgers down, I'll go get get me a Dodgers hat. Um, I can't see you wearing a Dodgers hat. It'd like be, I just, it'd be rough. It, um, it feels like it would just be, you know, given your your A's history and and those two teams, it just seems like that wouldn't be a. It just didn't seem like that would work there. Yeah, you know? I, haven't get, I haven't gotten over Kirk Gibson yet. So. Yeah, I was gonna say Dennis Eckersley would would probably slap you yeah. over this. But Ricky yeah. certainly would. Yeah, yeah, Ricky, Ricky, Ricky would. Um, yeah, it's uh, it, it, I, I don't know. It, it, I, I hope for Brian's sake that there's, it's a great game and that the Twins win, but um, I, I don't have confidence that that's gonna happen because I, I just don't. <laughs> have you when you lived out in the bay area did you go to an a's playoff game they they did not uh they were not in the playoffs when i was out there oh, okay I, I guess that you would have been out there at the tail end of the the bean ball kind of run and right before they sort of reinvented themselves yeah we we uh i was there for the ben sheets kevin kuzmanoff era so <laughs> what an era yeah what an era ben sheets had a hell of a curveball he did. he did that big, big 12 6 breaker. Young Mike Schaefer wanted to throw a Ben Sheets curveball. He could not. Yeah. You, if, you, if you would have would have been able to, you could have gotten $9 million for it when you're past your prime. So, tell you what, that thing was worth $9 million when it worked. It's just yeah. that he always had blisters and elbow injuries and everything else. All right. That's enough about Ben Sheets. Speaking of blisters. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> you want the transition? Go for it. No, I'm good. Uh, speaking of blisters, Nebraska football blistered Illinois on the road. Um, probably probably had some blisters, too, from just, uh, you know, may- maybe that's why they're dropping the ball so much in the second half, the blisters. Um, I'm very curious how you're going to work blister into whatever we just watched on Friday. Uh, I, I mean, we're, we, we've got like an interesting kind of mile post here, right? Like you're... You're at the halfway house. You're getting the hot dog at the turn, and, and you're going to come back. There's six games into this thing. Should we talk about where things stand on offense and defense? Do you want to talk a little about Illinois? Where do, where do you want to go? Let's let's start with a little bit about the Illinois game. We don't have to spend too much time on it, um, clearly, but we should at least sort of discuss it. I guess – now, have you done your customary three rewatches? I've got two in. I think I've got a pretty good <laughs> – I've got my arms around what happened in Champaign, um, so we can talk how, about it. How often during the rewatch were you like, oh, yeah, and that happened? Because yeah. a lot happened in a game in which only 27 points were scored. Um, yeah. And, you know, some good, some really bad, and a lot of Nebraska football. That was probably, that was probably a four-touchdown Nebraska win, like it should have been. Oh yeah, there's um, no argument for me on that at all. Like that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the it's, fact they don't have a three for their first number is just jarring. Yeah, I mean they what they went five times in Illinois territory in the second half and got three points. I mean yeah. that's not good. But no, I mean it's a lot of the things that popped up in the Minnesota game popped up in that Illinois game. It just happened that Illinois wasn't able to take advantage. Nebraska's defense, I think, is more than holding up its end of the bargain. But yeah, I mean, it was, I don't know that there was anything that I saw like on the watch back where I was like, oh, that's that's kind of surprising. I mean, I think if anything, I was, 
I was more impressed with the defensive effort. I mean, I, I don't think Illinois isn't kind of like the Brett Bielema team that you think of. That offensive line is not very good. Uh, Luke Altmeyer was fine. I mean, I think if he had a better supporting cast around him, you could have done something there. But it was really Isaiah Williams and uh, Altmeyer, um, and that's about it on offense. So, you know, I, I that was a game that Nebraska should have leaned on him, and they did. And and you know, I, I think, you know, everybody likes to talk about turning points right when they happen, and you don't really know, you know, until games down the road. Um, but I mean, that, that goal line stand was a big deal, um, in, in opening that game and not only kind of changing the way that, that the game was going to play out, but it kind of, I think was cathartic in a way after things played out against Michigan, you know, I mean, you, you basically get your head beat in for four quarters. Michigan plays five court, four quarterbacks. The starting quarterback is kissing his girlfriend on the sidelines. And, you know, it, you needed that kind of a performance, I think, to basically say, okay, that's Michigan. They're going to do that to a lot of teams, and we're totally fine. Yeah, it's, that's a good point on that on that goal line stand. I mean, I just know going into just kind of those last couple of plays of that first drive, all I was thinking was this is just about as terrible of a start as you could have if you're in Nebraska. I mean, you're just going to immediately give – Illinois momentum, your defense looks like it didn't show up right away. You had all that talk, you know, coming into that game about how they needed to start fast and they needed to, to show up right away and all of these things. And it's just like, this is the exact opposite of what was talked about. And then you get those plays and they they were, you know, I think there was some benefit there from some poor play calling from Illinois, some benefit from just a complete misread by the running back on that fourth down run. I mean, I think if he bounces that, it's an easy touchdown. But a lot of it just comes back to me, and we're, we're going to talk specifically about the defensive line here in a bit. But a lot of it just comes back to how quickly those guys up front have gone from intriguing to just outright, like, an asset for this team. I mean, I, I was thinking about this brunch. I was writing the stock market report. How many position groups would you – say are better than Nebraska's defensive line right now. I mean, yeah, you have I mean, arguably your breakout player of 2023 and Nash Hotmacher as part of that. You have, you know, the future with Cameron Lenhart and Prince Will and uh, Riley Van Poppel and Sua Lafotu all getting important reps throughout these last couple of weeks in Big Ten play. Um, you have steady veterans and Blaze Gunnarsson and uh, – uh, Ty Robinson, you have guys that, you know, you're hoping to get more out of when they return and Brody Tagaloa and some others. I mean, it just, it feels like that unit has quickly become, I don't want to say the strength of the team, but certainly towards the upper portion of the strengths of this team. Maybe yeah. it is the strength of this team. I don't know. No, you're right. I mean, it's, it's a mix of veterans and young guys to where, and I, I think this has been the problem a, lo a lot with Nebraska's defensive line in the Big Ten era is that you you had you always had like three guys, maybe four guys that you felt OK about um, that your frontline guys, the guys you were leaning on a ton. And then beyond that, it was like, OK, we have no idea what direction this is going to go in the future. We don't have much depth there if a guy gets hurt or something like that. And I think that that to me more than anything has been the, you know, certainly Huttmacher's, you know, emergence has been, you know, long, long overdue and, and has been huge. But I mean, you named him off. I mean, it, Riley Van Poppel is in making that stop on fourth down. Um, I know they really like A.J. Rollins. That's why they moved him from tight end over to defensive end. Yeah, uh, that's a name I forgot to mention. You know, Cam Linhart is a guy that, you know, I, I think – me personally, I wasn't sure where he was going to fit in at, out of high school. I mean, it was he, he always kind of struck me as a tweener, um, but he's fit in fantastically um, and, and has, you know, done a really nice job there. Prince, well, I think you saw the other night um, what he can do. And, and even a guy like Jamari Butler, who, you know, more outside linebacker, defensive end. I mean, he was really disruptive against Illinois. I, I'll, I, I wouldn't fight you on that, that. Um, you know, and, you, and, and Ruquan Buckley is a guy that they've, they've worked like crazy with to try to get him up to speed too. So there, there's a lot of guys that, um, 
you know, you, you could maybe even go like three deep and feel okay there. I mean, it, it's just, there's not a big drop off between the first and the second groups. And that's huge in a league like the big 10, where you just, you can't just rely on three guys or four guys to just do it for you all season. Do we just want to just switch this? Or we'll just start with defense since we just kind of dove right into sure. the defensive yeah. line there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I it just sort of, what has me kind of excited is that you still have Vincent Carroll Jackson, which they seem to like. I, did he travel? He I traveled, he traveled yeah. Yeah. Uh, for the Illinois game. That strikes me as someone that they'll probably try to redshirt, uh, but they want to also get in there. He's fresh into his football career, kind of like a Jamari Butler was when he arrived, Yeah, uh, when he did um, for the previous staff. I mean, so it's one of the things that's interesting when we're talking about this 3-3-5 and you talk about the defensive line is sometimes – I almost feel like we have to talk about it as a defensive front more than the defensive line. Cause you mentioned Jamari Butler and what they're getting from some of those guys from the Jack position. I mean, I think chief borders was in there on that stop on the goal line. Uh, MJ Sherman's had his moments. Like the, the other thing that's been good for this Nebraska defense as a whole, but especially up front is like, we often get caught up talking about the best performances or the guys who have really stood out. Sometimes you also just need those really solid role players to be really solid role players. And while MJ Sherman is never probably going to be the five-star recruit that people had hoped, uh, you know, when he went to Georgia initially, and then of course he transfers here, you know what he is? He's a guy that you can put out there a bunch and you're going to get a pretty solid performance from, and you know that he's going to be able to help your football team. Same thing probably for cheap borders. Another guy that you're, you're not getting, a superstar here out of the transfer portal, but you're getting helpful depth on your defense. You're getting a guy who's played uh, now, um, you know, for Nebraska and certainly was playing a little bit for Florida and, and can provide and help fill in some of those gaps where you've had some recruiting misfires in recent years by giving you a little bit of extra depth. And then that allows a guy like Jamari Butler, all of this to say, and, and you mentioned Jamari Butler and how well he played against Illinois. That allows a guy like Jamari Butler, who I think you would agree is, probably has the most potential of anybody in those in the jack spot um that allows him to sort of take his time but also start to flourish a little bit like this is someone that you know i don't think we've begun to see jamari butler's best football but this is a guy who flashed immediately against colorado his first game of the year he's helped the huskers a number of times it feels like he is maybe the most consistent in terms of of getting some pressure towards the quarterback now he's let a few guys get away from him uh from time to time but i i feel like what we're seeing is kind of the evolution of someone becoming uh, a fringe all big 10 type player you know for future seasons i mean i don't want to i don't want to overdo it like we're not we're not seeing randy gregory incarnate here but we're seeing something that we haven't seen a lot of and that's an outside pass rusher that is a bit of a threat in every game that he goes in yeah, I mean, it, that was kind of the missing piece. and ha I mean, it's still missing to a degree. Yeah, it's, um, I, I wanted to, to not oversell it, but I do think it's important to acknowledge that he's doing more than yeah. what we're used to seeing. Yeah, for sure. And, I mean, coming out of high school, he was a, guy, a, bas he was a basketball player. I mean, who was had just gotten into football. And, you know, the you mentioned the Colorado game being his first one. I mean, he missed time in the fall camp with, because of a stinger it was a little bit slow coming back from that. So he's a guy that is almost a couple weeks behind, I guess, in terms of just rounding into form. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I think you're starting to see the, the production that people saw that he could eventually be as a recruit. I mean, that's why, you know, Tennessee was involved and SEC schools were sniffing around uh, late in the process after he came into Nebraska and, you know, Again, a guy that had been in the transfer portal when Matt Rule was hired, they recruited him out of the transfer portal. Another guy that I think they kind of looked at this defense and what they were going to need and were like, okay, we, we need playmakers and guys that can win one-on-one -on -one in the pass rush. And that's that's what he was doing against Illinois. I mean, Nebraska was committing more guys to pressure because I think you know Illinois' offensive line had shown that they were susceptible to that. But I, I mean, I, there were also just plays where Butler was just flat winning one-on-ones and that, that I, I think if you can do that, that's kind of what takes this defense to the, the next step in the second half of the season. Yeah. As we kind of continue to work through this defense and we just talked about the Jack linebackers, I, I didn't, I didn't 
mention him specifically, though I thought about it in the, the stock market report. I feel like we're getting the usage and the best version of Nick Henrich that we've seen so far as well. They've done a really nice job of not asking him to be in coverage a ton. They've done a nice job of matching him up with the right opponents where he can kind of play forward or you're putting him in a situation where he can blitz. You know, he's someone that to me brunts, and I, I think that you would probably agree, better player moving forward than it is moving backwards and maybe even a little side to side. And so what I've really liked about Tony White is that when he has a guy like Nick Henrich that can give you value, he's amplifying that value by putting him in situations to be successful and to take advantage of where he can help you and trying to minimize his exposure in areas where he's less likely to help you. And so I like that seems really what a concept, right? I know it seems really (laughs) basic. And yet, you know, like you watch the same team and the same players that I have for the last decade It's also kind of radical. Like, hey, this guy isn't great in coverage. Maybe we need to get him off the field in those situations. Maybe he's got to play 70% of the snaps when we know that we're facing a team that's going to try to really keep it around the line of scrimmage. And then only 30% of the snaps when we know it's a situation where they're going to be trying to throw the ball. Like, I, the usage has allowed him. He's going to have a new career high in tackles for a loss. He already has a career high in, in sacks. He's going to end up with more of those numbers than what he had coming in. He might have more numbers this year than he did for his career in tackles for a lot. Like, again, I'm not, this isn't an all big 10 performance. Like, but what you're doing is you're maximizing your roster in a way that we aren't used to. And I do feel like that should be pointed out. And especially when you don't have Luke Reimer, who's a really valuable part of that defense and can fly around. Being able to use John Bullock and Nick Henrich and Mackay Bayer and cycling those guys so you have the right ones in at the right situation. And you wrote about this in, in your uh, your 247 breakdown. Like Rob Dvorak, I, I gush about Terrence Knighton every time I get. Rob Dvorak has quietly really done a nice job on that second level. Yeah, no, and, and another, I think I was thinking about this as it kind of relates to Henrich. I feel like, I feel like Nebraska's gotten – the fact that they've gotten deeper around him has helped a ton. And you mentioned John Bullock. I think that's been a huge piece of it. He's a guy that I think as, as a former defensive back is really comfortable in space. Mm-hmm. Um, Javin Wright's another one that I, I think is really, they've done a nice job of bringing him along and can kind of, again, like you said, fill those roles where you, you don't have to have Henrich in there on third down um, where he's having to cover a running back or, run them with the tight end because you can put right in there or you can put um, Bullock in there. And I I've been impressed with the way that they've been able to kind of paper over the fact that they haven't had Reimer in there the last couple weeks. Um, I thought that was going to be a big issue against Illinois, but um, you know, and, and, and I say this as only credit to Nebraska's defense, but you really didn't notice that he wasn't out there. Right. Um, and, and I, I think, I wrote about it, like you said. You know, I think I think Rob Dvorak has done a really nice job of managing a room um, that, that has a lot of different looking pieces in it. Um, it. It's a in this defense, I think a tough position to coach in some ways. Um, but you know, I know that Matt Rule sees him as very quickly going to be a defensive coordinator somewhere. Whether it's you know what whatever that ends up being. He believes that Rob Dvorak has a very, very bright future um, as a defensive coach. And he's a quieter coach. Um, you know, he doesn't give a lot when he's in front of the media. But I think he's done a really nice job of um, developing that group. And, and got a lot of guys, when you just kind of go down the list, that uh, were maybe overlooked, um, had injury issues in their past that they hadn't gotten on the field. Um, and, and, you know, he, he's done a good job, I think, of <laughs> – the other thing to remember is he's also learning the three three five for right. the first time and having to teach yes. that to line. That's what's remarkable. You have these yeah. assistants that didn't coach in this system, and Tony White. You know, he got up there a few weeks ago and he talked about how his favorite part of this whole experience has been just working with guys and taking their ideas and his ideas and meshing it for this fusion of a defense. Um, again, I didn't mean to cut you off, but like that is another remarkable part of this whole turnaround to me uh, defensively, is it's kind of happening overnight. Anyways, continue. No, I'm good. I 
that that was that was kind of it on linebackers. I mean, I I think when you asked if there's a group that I would say is better than the defensive line, I would I think the linebackers are kind of quietly mm-hmm. right behind them, I guess. And I and and maybe part of that's credit to the defensive line too. I mean, they they're doing that that good of a job up front, but I, I think the depth that they've been able to develop at linebacker has been pretty impressive. I think because that was one of my big question marks going into the season was like, what the hell is this going to look like and who the hell is going to play? Um, but I think they've made it work really well and, and they've done it without uh, Reimer in there for a good chunk of it. It is, you know, remarkable. If you look back at all of the questions you have, how many start with what the hell, Yeah, you know, and then the, the rest of it follows. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that on offense, but the defense. Yeah. I don't know if hell's the word that ends out, yeah. but, you know, that's a different conversation. Yeah. Um, all right, let's finish up with defensive backs here on the defensive side of the ball. This is a unit that um, kind of been up and down. I, I Again, Friday was another weird one where it felt like Quentin Newsom largely has not been thrown at all year, and then here's Illinois, and they're like, all right, we'll go right at him. And they kind of had success, right? Like they, you know, before we even get to the their lone touchdown pass, which is a great throw by Altmeyer, maybe a slight, slight push off by the receiver, and then everyone, everyone I know is upset about uh, the lack of a holding call on the, on the back end of that play on the, you know, on the line, but whatever. Newsom got beat. He got beat several times on Friday. That was a little bit surprising. And it maybe also speaks to why Nebraska does not do a lot of tight coverage, because if that's your best corner and he got beat pretty soundly in the first half, um, on several plays, he did come back with an interception later in the game. You can kind of see, like, I just, I don't know now that we've sort of seen that. I just don't know that they trust the coverage skills of Hartzog and Newsom and Hill to hold up in the way they want to run this defense. Like, I think they're more comfortable leaving it how it is with those gaps uh, and the spacing than they are just bringing the tight coverage. Because they did it a couple times against Illinois, and they got burned. Yeah. I I would need to, to need to dig in a little bit more to how Tony White's done it in the past. I mean, it, isn't that kind of a hallmark of the 3-3-5? It's not – you don't want to say Ben don't break, but, like, they they kind of do that in the in the secondary a little bit more. Yeah, I think it's – some of it is – some of it is situationally dependent. Um, but I, it's also, I guess – the problem I have with it is like, okay, if you want to play some off coverage, then your guys have to be able to break quicker on these throws. They need to like, so the, the repeated complaint I have with the secondary is they're just not getting their hands on enough passes. Like you just, you don't see enough pass deflections for a heavy zone defense. And so um, that is one area that I think has to get better no matter what, but Again, when you the numbers are always going to look bad when you make teams run for less than 40 yards because what are they going to do? They're going to have to throw. They're yeah. going to throw in high volumes. I I don't know what this number is relative to the rest of the country, but it feels like Nebraska has had a lot of passing attempts against it because teams have just jettisoned the running game early on. Now, some of that is who you're playing, but here's the thing. I look at the rest of their schedule. Wisconsin's like the only team that's just going to be able to line it up and run the football how they probably want everybody else is going to have to do some razzle dazzle or probably going to have to go to the air. And even Wisconsin would, I think, try to pass um, just as much as they're going to try to run. And their running game has been up and down based on who they play. Yeah. The, the, the secondary, the, the one thing that I think you're right. I mean, like the, the lack of turnovers, I mean, they aren't getting their hands on a ton of passes. Um, It's not even just a turnovers. It's not even like most of the incompletions are either overthrows yeah. or drops. Yeah. Like it's not even like they're they're not making the ball go incomplete. You know. Yeah. Um. I I think I've been anecdotally impressed with the way that they've rallied to the ball. Like I think they've they tackled relatively well mm-hmm. on, on uh, in, in the secondary. I think Isaac Gifford played the best game of his career against Illinois. Um, and we didn't give him a game ball. We no game ball. I I do. I do wonder about kind of the long-term impact of not having Deshaun Singleton in there. We, we haven't really gotten clarification on when he could come back because I, I guess he can. Um, but it kind of made it seem like he wouldn't. And then they've reversed that a little bit, I guess. 
Yeah, he's he's not out. So yeah, I I think I think that picture I'm curious to see because he was so he's so good in run support. Um, you know, you had Phelan Sanford step in. He had the forced fumble against Illinois. I think he's steady and solid, but I do kind of get concerned about depth back there. That's the one spot on the defense where you're kind of like, well, you know, once you get past that top group, what what does that look? I mean, they, they had Hartzog playing some safety. They've had Quentin Newsom even playing some safety uh, after uh, Singleton went down. So they've got, you know, they can move guys around, but I, I don't know that that's necessarily the best look back there. But, I mean, they, they've been solid. Solid but not spectacular. Is that is that a fair yeah. summation of, of where things are back there? I think that's fair. I think that's fair. I want to also take this time because you mentioned Phelan Sanford. Quick shout out to Nebraska's walk-on program because without it, this team would be in a lot of trouble. Like you go through, they're getting good performances from walk-ons almost everywhere um, on this roster right now. Like they they need these guys. They need them in um, a really, really important way. And the fact that they're able to use that and utilize it and they're on a play with their defense and not drop off is, I think, a good sign for the future and, and what they want to do. So, all right, let's take a quick time out. We'll come back. We'll talk about the offense. I'm guessing we're going to run through that a little bit quicker, even though it is significantly less, uh, less successful so far this year. All right. You're listening to the Husker 24 seven podcast. It is time to talk about Nebraska's offense and what they are going to do over the final six games to get Nebraska exactly three wins to go to a bowl game because Michael Brunts does not want to spend another Christmas around his family. He's tired of it. <laughs> he wants to go somewhere. Detroit, New York, Las Vegas, they're all on the table. Phoenix. There's a Phoenix chance out there. Oh, I didn't want to give you something great. You know, Las Vegas <laughs> felt like that was a pretty good step for you. Yeah. So. Phoenix is further down the pecking order than Vegas, so. No, that's yeah. true. With that guaranteed rate. Yeah. Uh, All right. Well, go ahead. Dive into it. Quarterbacks. Just just rip the Band-Aid off. Let's take us right into this. Yeah. I mean, th- this is not the quarterback picture we would have uh, envisioned when we were heading to Minneapolis uh, before that game. And I guess Jeff Sims is healthy now. Um, you know, it, it's been more than a month since the uh, the injury against Colorado. And Heinrich Harburg, you know, for all his all his warts and the you know right around fifty percent completion percentage is is getting the job done. Um, you know, I I, I generally don't uh, subscribe to the theory that wins should be a valuable quarterback statistic, but Nebraska's winning when he's in the game. And you know, I I, I think. You know, Matt Rule said something interesting this week. Where he basically said that if 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 Chubba Purdy had been healthy when Jeff went, I don't believe it. I I don't either. But like, don't believe it. The fact that he even says it, I'm like, well, that's interesting. I mean, to to go from that point where you're like, well, it could be Chubba, it could be Heinrich, if that's the case, to you know, basically more without saying it, kind of making Heinrich the guy. It's been a heck of a. Uh, you know, last, last month or so. And I, it, with the way that Nebraska's offensive line is and the, the very uh, slapdash wide receiver group right now because of injuries and departures, I, I don't know that there would be a lot of quarterbacks that would be standing back there, uh, you know, completing the high percentage of passes. But, you know, Harburg's done enough through the air. Um, he's gotten it done with his legs and it's not pretty, but it's worked. And um, I mean, that, that, that's the best grade that I can give the quarterback position right now is it, it uh, hopefully is on an upward trend, but it's it's holding steady. And that's about all you can probably ask for at this point. Yeah. What? Uh, so if you had to give your best guess right now today, October 11th, um, about 10 days before this game is even going to occur. Do you think Jeff Sims or Heinrich Harburg takes the first snap for Nebraska against Northwestern? I think you got to stick with Harburg. I mean, I, that's where uh, that's I'm where at. that's where I'm at too. But I feel like it's increasingly becoming more of an island uh, of an opinion. And they have not. I mean, they have 
stopped far short of just saying they're going to continue to roll with what has worked so far. So, yeah, I mean, I guess until there's something that they see that they feel like, you know, Jeff Sims gives them a better chance, I think they're just going to keep rolling with Harburg. I mean, I think Matt Rule likes likes the toughness. I think he has a little bit better feel, my sense is, in the in kind of the different quarterback run looks that they want to do. Um, but yeah, I mean that I, I just the conversation gets murkier now that Jeff Sims is healthier. However, it just seems like to me, and until something changes aside from just health, you probably just keep it status quo. But That's you right. have you you've got Sims to go to if if you need to, I guess. So there there's that that development. Yeah. Uh, let's just lump all of this together. Running backs, tight ends, wide receivers, your top guys at pretty much every spot there are banked up. Uh, didn't get a waiver or, you know, are Billy Kemp and they're having a fine season, but it's not, it pales in comparison to the Trey Palmer, or Samari Toure uh, type year. So what in the world does Nebraska do with its skill position players with six games left to go you don't have two of your top three running backs you don't have three of your top four wide receivers your tight end room has has been solid but it's it's not going to carry you I think that that much is evident like I don't know that they have the ability to just throw the ball 10 times to Thomas Fedoni in a game have that be successful and that can be a big chunk of your offense and I don't think um, that that's I don't think that's on the tight ends I'll no I yeah. look I don't want to I yeah. think I think quietly Thomas Fedoni's return is a harbinger of really exciting things in future seasons. I don't know how much of that's going to happen in 2023, but I think for a guy who I regard as one of the best high school players I've ever seen play in person, I think the fact that he's out there and he's getting these, these opportunities and he's just six games into his college career, basically, in 2024, I'm expecting a lot from Thomas Fedoni, and I think that would be fair. I mean, we'll see what the quarterback and the offense and all of that looks like. But I, I think there's reasons to be excited about the tight end room going forward. I don't know that you can rely on that a lot over the next six games. I think it can be a very helpful asset. I don't know that it can be a primary thing. You saw him more as a high school player than I did. Do you, do you feel like he's – I mean, obviously, he's gone through a lot with the injuries – but he seems like confidence wise in the way that he's playing, he's closer to what he was than he's been at any point. Is that fair to say? Like, yeah. do, you, do you see that? I, I do. I do see that. I also think, and again, like a lot of this, you know, recently being able to be in the stadium for those three straight home games, I wouldn't say he's open all of the time, but he has, he's, he's getting open on his routes. Like he is, he is a matchup problem for teams that want to stick linebackers on him. He is going to be open. Uh, whether the ball can get to him in a safe manner or not remains to be seen. But he, from a route running, getting open athletic standpoint, is only going to get better. Like, it's, it's going to be good, I think, for Nebraska in the future because of what he is going through this season, what he's learning, how he's getting better. And teams are going to have to commit different resources to him because I don't think you can cover them with linebackers a lot. Like maybe Michigan can, but most teams don't have guys that can run with them. And he's got, you know, he, he had that really bad drop and he would be the first to tell you it's a really bad drop uh, in that game against Illinois, but he's got good hands and he's willing to fight for the ball. Like I, he, I would like to see as the season goes along an emphasis of trying to get him and Nate Borkercher more involved as Nebraska gets inside the 10 yard line like find ways to get those guys to ball, let them use a little bit of power, let them fight for it in the air, that kind of thing. But I, I am excited about what we've seen from Thomas Fedoni in just these first six games because of what I think it tells me for the future, because he's getting better. I, I really do believe he's getting better. And that's a dangerous thing for opposing defenses. Youth movement at the wide receiver spot. Now that Marcus Washington is done for the season. We saw a ton of Malachi Coleman against Illinois, um, more than he had ever played. Hell of a block. Yeah, 
uh, Jalen Lloyd. Uh, probably seeing more of him. Jaden Doss was the guy that they really liked out of that group from the get-go, but he broke his arm and is now back. What are reasonable expectations in your mind for that wide receiver group, including Ty Han, Bullock, and Billy Kemp over the last six games? I would anticipate that Alex Bullock is probably more likely to be kind of your Marcus Washington role where, you know, he's catching some of those third downs. I, they went to him a couple times on Friday. He had a couple big catches to keep the change moving. I think he is just going to continue to elevate in that role. Among your freshmen, though, I Jaden Doss is the one that I want to – I want to see more of, obviously, like everybody. Uh, I think you you said it. They were excited about what he could bring prior to the injury. They're certainly still excited about what he's going to bring. Uh, it's just a matter of getting him in and, and knocking some rust off and everything else. And then with Malachi, I mean, you have this big body, right? Like he, he crushed that Illinois defender on that block and basically just took him completely out of the play. And he has a, a power element to his game that, you know, continue to just work him in, get snaps. I don't, again, I'm not, I don't know if he's going to have nine more catches. I don't know if he's going to get the double digit catches this year, but I like that he's able to play. I like that he can give you something, at least in terms of physicality off the edge when you need to block. I like that he has good size and, you know, he has great athleticism, Um Similar, but in a completely different track than Thomas Fedoni. I just, I want to see him out there, if only because it's going to benefit him to just continue to be in the run of action. And especially over these next six games, you're talking about teams that, you know, regardless of whether the division, well, we know the division's going away, regardless of, you know, the fact that there is no division, what Nebraska is facing in the next six games is sort of the soft underbelly of the Big Ten Conference. Like these are the teams that, I don't care how Nebraska compares against Ohio State and Michigan and Penn State right now. These teams coming up on their schedule, Nebraska keeps losing to them. They need to stop losing to Northwestern and to Purdue and to um, Iowa and to Wisconsin. Like These are the teams, regardless of whether the division is there or not, you're going to be measuring yourself against. And Maryland and Michigan State as well. Maryland is in a far better place as a football program right now than Nebraska is. And that's who you're going to be jockeying against for like the sixth spot in the big 10 some year. So like these games matter and being able to go and compete against them for guys like Malachi Coleman and Jalen Lloyd and Jaden Doss, these are critical moments, critical reps. You know, it's important to get the win because everybody wants the bowl game. It's also important to get the work because these are going to be big pieces for you because guess what's not in front of these guys anyone next year there's nobody in front of them the, you know Xavier Betts is gone Isaiah Garcia Castaneda has essentially missed two seasons in a row Marcus Washington isn't likely to get a waiver Billy Kemp is out of eligibility Alex Bullock is in front of them and no one else is whatever they go get from the transfer portal like their opportunity is both now and it's to set themselves up for the future like it is critical for Nebraska to make sure that these guys are getting reps as long as they can help you if they can't, then we're going to see a lot more Ty Han and triple tight end sets and everything else. But I I really hope that they can maximize, especially these two weeks at home where you got a better environment to play in against Northwestern and Purdue, maximize the opportunities for Doss and for Coleman and for um, Lloyd. Uh, blanking on the last name. We're, we haven't seen any Demetrius Bell. Are we going to see any Demetrius Bell? We're not. Is he... I, is he even able to play this year? He will be retrofitting this season. Yeah, and sure. um, I know there's been good reports on kind of what he's been able to do with scout team stuff. But um, yeah, and it's we also learned at Illinois that Bryce Turner and Jeremiah Charles, who were also part of that wide receiver group, have shifted to defense now. So, which I mean, tells you, you a lot. Yeah, you don't, you don't, I don't, you never want a guy to have an injury, but. I think for those three guys, I mean the 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 three freshmen, the path is now clear. Like you 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 are going to have to be counted on. The coaching staff knows these are the guys we have to coach and get ready. Like there's the the injury I think kind of provides a little bit of focus and clarity in terms of like what are we going to do with these guys this season? Like they have no choice. Like th th this is what the next six games are going to hold for them. So uh 
I'm always of the opinion too that you, you probably benefit more from playing those guys earlier in their careers than waiting around for like a fifth season and what that might bring anyways in the age of the transfer portal. So, you know, why not? I mean, I, I know they've felt good about them. Um, and, and actually the bye week comes at a pretty good time to try to get those guys up to speed. But um, yeah, I mean, it, just we were lumping the skill players together, but um you know, at every spot, or wide receiver and running back, it's very much kind of like, okay, what do we got here? Because the running back spot, you've got the fumbling issues with Johnson and Grant, but th- there's not much leeway for we're going to sit this guy and play this guy because you've basically got three backs, one of whom was Josh Fleeks, who was a, a wide receiver a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, – we we still got running backs to kind of – let's let's dive into this real quickly, like – Minute and a half or less. Running back situation, Anthony Grant. I I thought the guy who came out of Friday with the worst situation is Anthony Grant. That was the worst run defense that you're going to face. There was holes there, and he missed them. He fumbled again in a critical situation. He's going to be your starting running back because, again, you just kind of put your palms out and look around. There's nobody else. But I... I really was disappointed um, for Anthony Grant with how that game played out on Friday. And I wonder if we aren't going to see more Emmett Johnson, who in, you know, a little bit of run looked pretty good at times. He, he ran, Johnson ran with more conviction than maybe what I was Bigger. expecting. Yeah. Um, you know, it's unfortunate that he fumbled the way that he did because it, it looked like on the replay that, he was kind of moving away from Harburg. The exchange wasn't great, and I think that caused it. But yeah. up until that point, I was kind of like, okay, this is this is a guy that you can right. you, you can maybe do something with. I mean, you still can't, you're going to have to. I mean, there's yeah. there's no choice. But um, I, you know, aside fumble aside, um, I, I was thoroughly impressed um, with what I saw there, and I, it's it sucks too because that was the drive where it was like Illinois was just like okay. We're done. Like put the hammer down. Yeah, we can go home here. Run in, and and we can all, uh, you know, go do whatever you do in Champagne at night. But you know, they, the Nebraska to their <laughs> frustrating uh, way of doing things kept them in the game. Yeah. All right. Um, offensive line, another one where we could spend the. We we've, we've already talked for forty two minutes. We could talk about the offensive line for forty two minutes. We are not going to do that. Um, however. Real quickly, Nebraska's offensive line, largely the same group that it's been all year, kind of up and down. I feel like they're improved from last year, but the improvement doesn't feel like it's substantial. Is that fair? Yes. No, that's good. I mean, everybody that asks me about the offensive line, you say, okay, they, they've been better, but not great. Is that, that – that's where I'm at. I mean, it's I, – I think the addition of Ben Scott has generally been a positive at center, penalties aside. Um, against Illinois, I think he's he's really kind of studied things a little bit there. Um, you know the procedural pen, penalties and stuff like that. That that's probably the most frustrating thing out of everything is just getting lined up, not jumping off sides and, and false starting, and um, you you, you got to find a way to get that figured out. Whether I, you know Matt Rule was pretty adamant that Illinois was doing things to cause that, but I mean it's again a question of discipline and you're a team that's going to play a lot of really you know narrow margin games um you need to play steady football and and you know that that drive that Emmett Johnson fumbled on is a perfect example where it just every time it was a you pick up the yards and then you get the yards back and it's just you, you can't get out of your own way so I mean we'll, we'll see if they can continue to to take a step forward I mean you do have to say I think I think this is fair to say that that the guy that has been most improved from what he's been is Bryce Benhart yeah. this season. Um, so credit there. Yeah, no, I like, it's hard because I, I definitely think that they're better, but it's also like the margin of which, where they were at last year to where they are now. It's not like it's substantial, but they were also terrible last year, like clearly terrible. So 
They they are better. It still needs to get better, and the penalties are inexcusable. I don't I don't care if they're simulating snaps. Like it, you are having those happen against every opponent this year. Your offense can't afford to have to pick up more yards. It's just it's completely inexcusable. Nebraska's penalties right now, on average, would be worse than three of the last five years. So discipline remains an issue um, for this team. Uh, quickly, special teams. Anything you want to hit on there? I guess Tristan Alvano. Where's your confidence meter going in after the bye week? Man, we were you, so, you had you had called for three field goals. We were you so were on the cusp of three field goals. Had people tweeting at me after the after the second one when they were lining up for the third one. Yeah. It was uh it was disappointing. We were almost there. And uh you know like I, the hold was off. Like it, that there was it something it was ugly. Like the snap wasn't great, the hold wasn't great, the kick wasn't great, like the yeah. whole whole combination wasn't good. The kick was it was rushed. Like it, it it's one of those where you get quick at the top on the T box and, and you just you you just kind of whip it left. Like that that's what it looked like to me. But no, I mean I, I think I think the two makes are big for him. I mean, he, he came out and spoke after the game and was talking about, you know, slight tweaks that he'd made to technique. He's been talking to Drew and Chris Brown a lot about the mental side of things. He's going about it the right way. He obviously has a big leg. And, you know, sometimes, you know, for freshmen, it takes a little bit and we'll see if, if he can get that corrected and, and continue going in the right direction after the after the bye. But th- that game, I think, was I mean, he even said it, it was huge uh, for him to make those field goals just for seeing the ball go through the uprights. Um, punting has been OK. I mean, yeah. you, you have thought it'd be better. I yeah, mean, I mean, it's probably been, on me. It's been I fine. Yeah, um, it's been fine. Yeah, that's fair. The you've gotten a couple big plays through the first six games in the return game. You had Ramir Johnson with the big one against Minnesota that was really important. Um, you know, like they they blocked the punt against Illinois. Um, that that was another big one. Um, and then obviously Taggy recovering that fumble was huge. But uh, I mean, if, if you can get a couple of those types of plays over the next six games, I mean, th- those are the types of plays that can swing momentum, maybe even win you a game um, in, in a close one. So that, that, that group, I think, has been inconsistent, but largely okay. That, that's what I would say. The, the one thing that Nebraska has done th- that they have struggled with for eons is they're winning the starting field position battle. And Robert Jenny's been very good. Yeah, that's, that's no small thing because Nebraska has been terrible at that for a long time. All right. Uh, any other things you want to get to here, Brent? Uh, that that's a good summation. Do you do we want to hit very briefly recruiting, or are we good? Well, there's the bye week, and we're going to yeah. be very fascinated where Nebraska ends up turning up on Thursday and Friday as they go out onto the road. Um, so that'll be interesting if they try to hit, you know, a combination of recruiting your own guys, Kawan Lacey. Uh, someone that I think is going to be in the news quite a bit until he's signed. It's a really talented running back out of Lancaster. And you have Ole Miss has not stopped. Florida just offered. Uh, so that's going to be a battle. So Corey Barney is going to be a battle, but he remains committed to Nebraska. Nebraska with Garrett McGuire and Phillip Simpson and some of their Miami connections have really kind of locked their hooks in there. He's got an Arizona visit coming up. I wouldn't be at all surprised if they stopped by his school uh, this week um, to, to to see what's going on with Ja'Cory Barney and just kind of put in a little bit of FaceTime after he came up for that visit for the Michigan game. Those are, you know, and then Carter Nelson, I guess, would be the third one. Those are the three commits right now that if you're looking at Nebraska's commits, you're like, okay, what do I need to be concerned about? Uh, Carter Nelson would be the third of that group. There's talk of a USC Notre Dame visit uh, when when Notre Dame hosts the uh, the Trojans here in a couple of weeks. They had a coach, or excuse me, they had a recruiting staffer out at his game that I was at in Elgin a couple of weeks ago. He continues to just dominate in the way that you would want to see someone dominate in in Class D, and Ainsworth is is rolling right along. So I. Of those three guys, if you were like, okay, which one are you most confident sticks? It's probably Carter Nelson, in-state kid. He just visits all the time. His relationship with the staff is really good, by the way. If Notre Dame comes in and they're able to pull him away, it's because he's – it's not anything to do with a relationship. It would be a total bet on what the Irish are going to be relative to Nebraska. And he's very confident in Matt Rule and what Nebraska is going to be as well. 
Um, the one that I have maybe the most apprehension about might be Kawan Lacey. And part of that apprehension, Brunts, is running back room. They need bodies. They need talent. They need they need something. They're probably got to go to the transfer portal for a running back, I think, this upcoming offseason. But Kawan Lacey is a lot of the things that it seems like they want in a running back. And so the fact that you have these other SEC schools coming hard after him, um, and that doesn't look like it's going to slow down, also seems to be a uh, uh, a bet that he's going to be at least a talented individual that you'd want on your team. So he's the one that I think I'd be the most nervous about out of those. Anything else recruiting-wise that you want to touch on? Big, uh, big in-state game, undefeated West Side versus undefeated Millard South. Millard South, though, having to come off of a tough, tough, hard-fought 14-10 win over those Columbus Discoverers. So they might be uh they might be feeling a little bit before they have to take on West Side. Yeah, a lot of a lot of time in the cold tub this week, probably after the No one hits like the discoverers do. <laughs> I no, checked I, that I, score 15 times when I saw it because I did not believe it. Yeah. Um no, I think you hit it, you hit it, you did a good job of hitting. I, I think this is gonna be a big one, a big week too for evaluations for the staff. I, I think you, you might see an, a 24 offer or two pop up. I wouldn't be surprised at all if if you get some 25 and 26 offers out of some of the places they're going. I mean, I, I think with the staff, they've shown that they're willing to take advantage of every opportunity they have to recruit and evaluate and get, get Nebraska out there. So I would expect them to be pre- pretty active. Matt Rule said he's going to be out on Thursday and Friday. Uh, they've got one assistant coach who's out the whole week uh, recruiting. So it's uh they're they're not resting that's for sure um and like you said i mean i I think there's some guys in that recruiting class that you're gonna have to play defense on a little bit lacy he's a heck of a running back and i i think i think the one thing that nebraska can kind of offer over others well a couple things one is certainly playing time uh secondly uh they were the program that was there the longest and and he was never a plan b for them like some of the schools that are still trying to pursue him Yep. Yeah, that'll be that'll be interesting to watch as that all plays out. All right, Brunt, uh, if we don't have anything else, that concludes a bi-week edition of the Husker 24-7 podcast. Um, no BC this week, of course. We'll we'll come back strong next week. We'll have a podcast to, to get you into the week. We'll have the, the hype cast and, of course, a Sunday side session following that Northwestern game. Real quickly, I guess, uh, it's, we should have some predictions here. Can Nebraska win three more games on its schedule? Can they get to six wins? Michael Brunch, you're on the spot. Yes. I believe they can find three wins in the next six. So those are the can questions. Now, will Nebraska get three wins? I I think Nebraska will be knocking on the door of a bowl game when they go to East Lansing. We are in agreement. I like them to uh, hold serve at home these next couple of weeks against Northwestern and Purdue. And then I think it gets kind of interesting because I just don't know uh, with, with this team going on the road, everything else. But I, I also think uh, they will get to six and six as well. So we will uh, we'll see how we do at the end of the year when we revisit these predictions and everything else. Uh, for Michael Brunson, I'm Mike Shaver. We're Husker 24-7. Be sure to check out everything at Husker247.com. It might be a bye week, but it's not a bye week for us. We have plenty of coverage up on the website, and there'll be more coverage as we get into the weekend. So check out everything we have going at Husker247.com. We'll be back next week with some more Husker 24-7 podcasts.